Um, so yeah, I can introduce Jason and Albert. Um, so Albert is currently the managing director of digital at Walton Isaacson and is the principal and co-founder of Transient Identity. And in these roles, he carries the ethos of a strategic innovation consultant to many enterprises and has always possessed a firm understanding of how technology has continued to transform the discipline of marketing while disrupting today's conventional consumer engagement models. And within the digital, within the digital spectrum, his thought leadership lends strategic insight to how brand strategy, brand perceptions, consumer expectations, and purchase behaviors continue to evolve as technology advances. His digital experience involves brand marketing for Lexus, McDonald's, NYPD, HBO, and many, many more. And Jason, Jason is a marketing veteran and founder and CEO of YW3, You Win, We Win. It's a performance-based boutique consulting firm and accelerator where incentives are propelled by performance. A diverse and LGBT-run small business, YW3 works with its clients to instill centers of excellence internally and externally for long-term success. Throughout his career, Jason has embraced innovation and technology, having worked for some of the most exciting public and private media companies in the world, including Vice Media Group and Millennial Media, the world's, the world's largest independent mobile platform purchased by AOL Verizon and has held leadership positions at Discovery Communications, AOL Time Warner, Project Playlist, and Slide. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, um, please feel free to plug in questions as we go. Um, and then of course, if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I'll be sharing resources um, in an email afterwards. So definitely check those out. Um, but yeah, I'll hand it over to Albert and Jason. Pleasure right, cool. to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the uh, intro, Christine. And look, guys, I mean, we're when when I think about Jason and myself, we're almost kindred spirits in a sense that we are very much marketers first. We've been a digital book a long time, but we're we're not. I don't think any one of us calls ourselves digital guys or media guys. I mean, we are very much marketing first, very much consumer first. So a lot of things we're going to get into is really starting with why we're all in business. And that is the idea of how community can facilitate a marketplace exchange between, you know, product and buyers. I mean, that's what we're going to get down to. So without further ado, we're going to, we're going to get into it. This is a hot topic. One passion is to us, you know, Jason's, a lot of his orientation is around the community aspect. My experience in social media goes back to like 2004 when it was just the blogosphere. So he and I have both seen- MySpace. Of, right, right, exactly. We've seen much of what exists get built from scratch. So we have kind of an understanding as to sort of why it matters, why it doesn't, why people are chasing down the wrong rabbit holes. And I think COVID really accelerated a necessary overhaul to the whole conversation of community. When you think about the explosion of content, when you think about UGC coming back and being white hot again, I don't know if this is round three. Uh, when you think about a lot of the pivot towards commerce uh, and just the points of friction that COVID really highlighted for dealing in real life operating uh, business at the retail level. So a lot of our thing is gonna get to like, what, what does it solve? What should it solve? And how should the community approach? What should it be built on? What are some guiding principles? And really taking a step back at sort of the strategic level, what's got missed and in, in getting into that. So, you know, Jason and I- Also like, I would like say like COVID also changed a lot of things, right? We're talking um, a little bit about um, people shuffling jobs, but they called what happened during COVID the great reshuffle, right? And so local became a super hyper focus in everyone's life. And if you're a marketer, even more so, and on the heels of that, right, you've got next doors going public, right? And, and you know, in, in community from there trickles down to everyone's lives uh, across physical to digital as well. So right. excited to discuss those topics today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, dude, let's start with like what's lacking. You got you and I can punch the, through the ethos on this to the to the yeah. heart's content. One thing we talked about was like, where's the voice of the consumer? I mean, that's that you know the consumer is always going to win. Much of m many of us were in the middle. Media yeah. platforms, partners, dot coms, websites. You know, it's it's in the middle. You got a product on one side, you got a consumer who buys stuff on the other side. So where's that? Where is the the architect for around consumer psychology? I mean, look. You and I talk about why do people do the stuff they do? Because yep. the whole idea is to get them to do more. 
and how community should be built on that. I think the other thing you and I touched on was that we're in the B two B to C business. You know, we mm -hmm. support a client who's got objectives chasing down a consumer, and a lot of the thinking gets left at just B two B. It's kind of like agencies mm -hmm. servicing media partners, agencies of brands using a tool, but the consumer is kind of left out of the narrative. And I, and I think the the last thing is this whole abuse of data. everything is data driven. I was just so, going to say, it sounds so performance marketing driven. It's, it's like why I, when we, after we sold millennial media, I was like, even though we did a lot of brand work there, I was like, I wanted to focus more on humanistic brand storytelling with my business and our clients. And that's fully centered back into that community type of lens or lenses that you have. And, um, and I feel like, you know, there's so much ad tech, there's so much data, there's so much performance marketing and everyone's like marketing is killing it right now, but it's the major platforms that are benefiting from it. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Right. The, the, the big five, it's not, it's not um, the emerging communities that are, are, are digital or, 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 or bridging the gap between digital and physical right now, um, which is a little bit scary. And I think goes back to kind of what you call the rent rented platforms versus owned and operated platforms. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, look, let's part of the facts is, you know, the pre-pandemic behaviors that have, have don't exist anymore and where we are post-pandemic, it's likely going to, you know, create it. Let's call it a societal shift. One of the ones you talked about is we moved from people going shopping to always shopping. And part of that I'm is- Always shopping. Right. Because shopping right now on my other right. window. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> During yeah. the comments. Right. Because work and life is so intertwined. So the notion of community doesn't have separation from well, you're shopping without even knowing you're shopping when you're on Instagram too, though now, right? And yeah. so it's become so seamless, and their ad products are so um, perfected that you're shopping, you don't even know it, even if you're not consciously shopping. You're shopping now, right? And those peaks and valleys of we used to look at peak times for targeting for digital, like you'd be targeting various hours, like drive time, or, or time. everyone wants to go to the MySpace of today, which is TikTok, and they go, "Oh yeah, no, I'm it's cool. It hasn't been invaded yet, but the whole thing over at TikTok will tell you is make TikToks not ads. So you are already being marketed. You're already being sold to. TikTok's already making you buy it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So in the context of building community, you have to, you have to do it in that 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 mode. Like the fact that anyone can come down the rabbit hole at any point, at any inflection opportunity, not just around promotions, you know, seasonal retail at, at initiatives, the business calendar the average brand has that says, oh, these are our big moments for the year. And like, no, your moment actually just, one of them just passed five seconds ago. I mean, I, I, I hate the cultural, cultural calendar. I hate it. We're yes. very anti-cultural calendar. We're very always on um, yes. over here. Uh, it's like, uh, I understand the need for a cultural calendar. We even used it at Vice, but when I look back on it, it's kind of like, you know, a, a black and white list. It's an allow and block list, right? Like, I just, I can't get my head past it anymore, you know? Right. Um, and, you know, when we, when we do strategy over here. Right, because the consumer mindset doesn't move on a calendar for consumption. You know, it moves at time blocks. It's different if you're doing a vehicle, buying a house, mm -hmm. but start thinking about impulsive purchases. They can happen essentially at any moment. And I think that kind of lands to one of the major pivots you and I talked about was, you got to start treating social and social communities like the flagship store. The mm -hmm. flagship store is For not sure. a dollar building in, in Times Square. It's not the one in New York City. It's the one that is your most vulnerable footprint because it's always on digital. Yep. It's, it's the community where, look, people have a tendency to, to not only rent rate, but a bit pop off. Like that's what brands need to think about. They need to think about the social community as the flagship store. And what mm -hmm. used to be the flagship store in New York is now the secondary store serving a regional purpose or a tourist mm -hmm. community, but mm -hmm. not the one that breeds it could breed the most vitality for for an organization and most people don't look at their online community as a flagship enterprise but based on one what it can accomplish that's just the world we're entering and that's probably quietly become a consumer expectation mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting we work on a lot of these these stunts and where we eventize or momentize oh, instead yeah. of like focusing on a fixed type of date and yeah. we had a conversation just yesterday with like one of the largest companies in the world around a cultural one, a singular fixed date um, and whether, you know, and it's like, all right, so we, we got to crush it. And like the idea is like, all right, that's just like a jumping off point. It's like leading up to at and after is just as important. So if you're, if you're trying to hit a beat and get people to make action around a culture, cultural brand moment, 
there's a whole wave at that exact date that should happen after the moment as well too. And so like there was this whole mentality is like, we got to shut it down on the day of the actual cultural, cultural calendar. I'm like, actually you should be going for like two weeks after because you should be inspiring people to take action. And depending upon what social you're working on specifically TikTok, which is like very, very challenging algorithmically wise, like to, to carry on a beat, the algo might pick it up and you would lose all the opportunity after that particular beat if you don't carry that on. Um, it's just like a really, really interesting way to, to, honestly, it's not even, it's not sophisticated or overly strategic. It's just looking at it from, you know, a fix, taking something fixed and making it more variable, making yeah, it more absolutely. evergreen, more always on, you know? Yeah, so when Google came out with those micro moments, you know, to saying, look, brand affinity is not built by micro moments, not major moments. I mean, that's basically what they get into when they start to saying the average person looks at their cell phone 100, 50 times a day. I mean, that that's the, those are the opportunities for the brand moments to happen. Granted, that's staggering. And I understand that, you know, from a structural standpoint, you need to organize. But the reality is that the idea of, as you said, momentizing is really the norm. Calendarizing is, is a bit obsolete because mm -hmm. the consumer could present essentially whenever. That is how they think and feel. In and yeah, again. and it's I meaningful think. engagement too, right? Like if you're always on and you're thinking about it, you know, and we see a lot of this, like an impact in CSR marketing as well, too, where they're like, all right, so it's, I'm gay, it's like Pride Month. And we're like, well, it shouldn't just be about June. You know, we should think about this all year long, but sure. Um, and it's just taking a step back and just thinking about it a little bit differently. It's not that hard tactically to change that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, address that, you know? Yeah. I think the other thing is the notion of, of shopping amongst social groups. I mean, look, probably more so for women than for men, this notion of you always went and sh you went shopping with a gal pal, you know, you and your girl is gonna hit the store. I mean, but virtually that same thing is happening. It's just the configuration is in sort of bigger groups. You start mm -hmm. to find an affinity around categories, around products, around brands, but this notion of shopping within the context of personal social groups, and then using the group to help validate uh, purchase decision is part of the decision-making model. Like, hey, what do you guys mm -hmm. think? experience here. I mean, I think the idea of platforms like Yelp help accelerate that. The idea that I, let me check out a product review to get an understanding of, should I spend my dollars and let me hear from consumers mm -hmm. like me. But that is something that's growing in, 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 in great, in waves, just because with everyone always shopping, there's an infinite amount of opinions that are now emerging mm -hmm. Merchandise, and now you're well, you've got these interesting things going on too. Is shopping accelerate, especially in the beauty category during the pandemic? Yeah. Everyone was covered up outdoors from here up, so all the makeup products from here up were, were flying off the shelves. And the innovation around connecting the content and commerce and the platforms that had the technology capabilities with the filters were able to win and accelerate massively. And it wasn't, and then everyone started taking the beauty as a specific use case and it, it, it hyper accelerated content and commerce shopping on on the platform specifically on snapchat too right. um which was really interesting to see happen and it almost happened overnight right well let's get into that because there is an over servicing of certain platforms in terms of focus of brand than others so one of the things you and i talk about is if people really got into the why that people use facebook instagram some of the platforms in a ranking order it has less to do with what, what people think it is. It's actually social media usage is very heavily tied to arguing because in the, in the US, one of the things we love to do is debate. We debate everything, mm -hmm. sports, politics, yeah. you name it. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. it is. It's My nice. favorite thing to do is just to post something political, have everyone start going nuts and then delete it because like then all that effort, right? You know, it's like- Right, right. But yeah. when you start to think about that, people are there not for the reasons that the brand is strategically there. Most brands aren't in the business of facilitating confrontation, contention, and arguing. They're trying to- No way something yeah. easily consumable. But the reason users are there are for a very different reasons. And what you find is that brands are out of alignment for why the consumer is there in contrast to what they are trying to accomplish as business objectives. Mm -hmm. So look, Facebook had already apologized for, yeah, we, we misled you. Likes don't really mean anything. It's not a metric. It's not outcomes. It, it's not an ROI tactic, even though they had the world chase down likes for what half a decade. So yep. you start to understand, okay, well, why are people in Facebook from the beginning? And, and at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with product consumption. And there are platforms who are better suited based on the brand and their category for that. And I think what brands have to do is take a step back and understand what are the rules and games? Why, why do people here all day long? What are they really mm -hmm. doing? And does that align with what we do? And if they don't, we probably should under invest 
or pivot. Yeah. We call it core and explore over at YW3. You, you identify what your core socials are and then you have your exploratory socials, right? And, and, and that's really like a great baseline um you know unfortunately one of those core verticals is super expensive in a lot of these um areas which is youtube youtube is like the most expensive platform out there and rightfully so um but like you know you know from a core and over indexing and we hyper hyper focus on community over here at ww3 of emerging media um, portfolio we have our creator portfolio which any Leibowitz is in and then we work with brands which I've, I've referenced as well and you know Facebook Instagram are tried and true and the power of those platforms together and is just undeniable the efficiencies and efficacy of them there right now right and so you know it's like identifying what your core and by the way that will vary depending upon who we're talking to the lens that we're looking through. And we talked about, it cannot be neglected that the tried and true rented platforms, but then you go down to the birth of the internet news groups and the current iterations of them within forums and very, you know, niche communities right. as well that can't be ignored. Right. Absolutely. That's, that's a, a perfect point because we're starting to see a shift towards niche communities. One, because people are tired of the sentiment, the attitudes, the messiness, the shaming, all that stuff that happens on the major platforms and they just burn out. I mean, look, look, it, it's cool and fun, but when it becomes the norm and the, uh, the, the basic user experience is the foundation of it, you know, it's turned off. So you're starting to see people migrate to niche communities. And obviously the beauty of those is people in niche communities, they, they know their stuff. They're not yeah. gaslighting stuff. They're not starting stuff. I mean, these are people highly knowledgeable, pretty well read. The, the ideal people who can build a business and build your brand, they have passion around it. So, I mean, they're adept. They, they operate the way, let's say, the, the, the developer community is around motherboards. Let's just say mm -hmm. we're talking about Intel. I mean, these people have a high acumen for the subject matter. They're experts in their job and discipline. It really hinged upon that. And brands need to start looking at niche communities and how they can help build understanding around product innovation, um, mm -hmm. how they can rethink customer experience. And look, there's nothing wrong with using the big platforms as a gateway. But if you're really sure. going to get a lot of things accomplished, things that are accomplished in a form of intimacy, or form of yeah. I mean, there's so many different niches, right, that you could go into. You could say a podcast is a niche, right? You could say uh -huh. a forum is a niche for BMW 330CI, like model level, whatever. I mean, like this is like, this is for real and there's scale in them too, believe it or not. Actually, I think like um, the emergence of audio and even though Clubhouse is struggling to find its place within uh, micro to macro community kind of re-emerged the, the, the niche community uh, lens, um, yeah. which is pretty interesting as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's kind of move into some of the key things that, that really are driving the change. I mean, I think we spoke from time like, look, here's a reset. Some of the things that we thought about related to the community. I think when you start to look at some of the main things is, is, is what this form is about. Let's start with content. Um, UGC is white hot again. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Well, now we have PUGC and that's all TikTok's fault. And now you have all the creator programs. We have profess professionally user generated content yes. and it's not going away anytime soon because it is a creator's first world out there right now. Absolutely. And I think when you think about UGC, I mean, look, the idea of harnessing what the consumer, you know, again, the, the identified segment who only gets to win here is already saying related to a product or category or vertical, even your portfolio, is what you should be harnessing. I mean, it's the reason why people still love consumer reviews on Amazon, on Walmart.com. It's, it's why that's a syndicated business model between you know, platforms like, like Power Reviews and Bizarre Voice who take it and syndicate it out is because it, it matters to hear from like-minded individuals. So mm -hmm. when you start to think about that, the idea that you can use tools, and I know Meltwater has an offering as an example, we know a couple of the companies allow you to do programmatic targeting to harness what people are already saying in their voice as licensed content that you can pull into, you know, your platforms that you control as communities or even turn around and do retargeting of I me. Mean, the activation of voices that already exist seems to be a misnotion. It seems marketers want to go spend fresh dollars to start a new dialogue versus hijacking the one that exists. And, you know, maybe you got some context of what you've seen. I mean, no, I think that's like spot on. I mean, we're constant, marketers are constantly trying, to, even when they find the right voice and they try and manipulate it and massage it and dilute it. And, and they're not doing it intentionally. It's because there's just so many optics on it, right? Because when it costs a lot of money to, to develop that, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I, it's difficult to not dilute and to ruin it even when you find it. Forget about finding it. Even when it's found, it can get 
diluted. Um, we work with Annie Leibovitz and, you know, creative art and assets. And, you know, Annie is a global icon, uh, LGBT activist, you know, we could look at her global to, you know, national following across portrait photography. She's a portrait photographer, but all the way into fashion. So her communities are far and wide, global and local activist, marketer, you name mother, you name it, like it's in there and there's many different ways that we can cut it. But when we work and we create these beautiful brand campaigns, it ultimately needs to be distributed somewhere. And then by the time it gets to the, you know, we have your creative agency that makes ads out of it. And then we have the media agencies and the social agencies that come in, the messaging will, and, and, and everything will often get diluted. So it's, it's finding the magic and then not ruining the magic as well when you start bringing it bring it to life because the investment is large um, at the at the macro you know creator community level and then even at the at the at the micro community those are a lot of investments there's a lot of work that needs to go in to get the proper authentic storyline out across social right um, yeah. owned and operated for the most part you know Annie's owned and operated for archive she uses all rent rented platforms and the future of her business is social media right and so uh, and our job is both, you know, at YW3, we manage her creative art and assets and her marketing campaigns and brand partnerships. But we also manage her social media and her channels. So it's our responsibility to not only deliver the magic and keep it intact, but then to also um, publish that through her eyes, through her social media. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, the brands have different ideas on what that should look like. Um, and it's finding that proper measure between those two when you're working with the community efforts um, to ensure that you're not infiltrating becoming an infiltrator, right? You well, could probably strike the balance between the calendarized approach to content, because look, yeah. brands are brands, so they're going to have to produce their assets the way they yeah. want, using their timing. But the momentized, let me use your word again, is where you where UGC comes into play that becomes the filler in between yeah. this quote unquote calendarized because of a market. Well, see, it's, it's authentic, right? Like people, like it needs to have a through line, um, you know, when we think about bringing these stories to life on any social, we're looking across her PR beats, her personal life, the brand yeah. campaigns, what's going on in the world, the portrait subjects and what's going on in the world that are coming into, into play that we didn't even, we'd even heat map originally that oftentimes happen, right? Which are really amazing. Like we have a portrait subjects coming up in STEM month in October and this brand campaign got moved back and we're like, holy shit, look at this amazing beat we should be capturing here. This can't be missed. It's an earned, owned, and paid opportunity. Yeah. No, I like that because I like the fact that when you talk about content, you're talking about mapping it on the entire ecosystem. Let's take her as a brand, operates, this, exists in and touches. A lot of times marketing, it's all counterized around marketing initiatives. Not everything right. the business actually is doing and running in front of them because it's all part of the storyline. So it doesn't matter if it's essentially appearances. And by the way, listen, it, it, it's different between brand marketing, product marketing, performance marketing, which can be right. a subset of both, right? And so like, there are nuances between this. I am referencing a brand campaign right now that it has specific line lines to here and there to different products, but as an overarching brand campaign. Right, gotcha. Yeah. To, just so a little bit more clarity to that, just because you could be like, all right, he's talking about this, but is it specific? So. Right, right. Well, look, let's come back to this creator conversation because, you know, yeah. I, I worked, did some work with the uh, YouTube Black Voices Creator Fund, which I thought was brilliant because... We're also a part of Facebook's 3PP program, Creator First program. There's only 15 companies in the world in it. Um, it's a two-year program in which it's a creator first, um, helping, um, you know, onboard creators, uh, you know, uh, that aspire to be like Annie, mm -hmm. right? At that, at, at, um, but are, are well on their way, alpha beta monetization, and just like we work very, very closely um, with the key socials, including TikTok when it comes to creators. So exciting topic for sure and very great and, and part of it thinking is we need to draw a distinction between just an influencer and creators because i think when you look at this comes up all the time right right people burn through influencers like it's an algorithm this is someone who fits the bill they did a post they did this okay on to the next a creator is more like potential brand ambassador someone who bleeds the category loves the brand would, would love a long-term deal and relationship. I actually, I think of it a little bit differently through our lens because I have Annie. So like I put Annie automatically in the creator side and right. then everyone else is on the influencer side because we want, um, I've been on the board of Influential, um, which is a, a an influencer media company um, for seven years. And so I have a very specific way that I look at like influencers and the way that I look at like creators, but that's my own definition. But oftentimes okay. comes up because I just feel like creators, um, 
less of a dirty word. There was a moment where influencer became a dirty word and then influencers saved everyone last year. And yeah. so now influencers okay, right? Yes, the Kardashians made it a dirty word because people were- but The Kardashians ruined it for everyone. Right. We're flying all around with these COVID birthday parties. And then everyone, including my, my, my uh, the company that I am on the board of, we, we struggled for a bit, but then no one could produce ad campaigns or content and all they had were influencers. And so that hyper accelerated it. And how, much, how many billions of dollars are being invested in creator programs this year, Albert? We can't keep up. No, no, it's, uh, I, it's, it's going up and up probably for the next, probably the two in 2025 easy, but I think the creator element of it in mixing the conversation is just gonna accelerate because people are being incentivized to just build stuff for themselves for brands. I think the brands need to start- It's an arms it. race for sure yeah. right now. How do, we, how do we have a strategic partnership with a series of creators who are gonna essentially support us? Because here's the thing about creators, whether, whether you use them or not, they are fans, fanatics of the brand or category anyway. It's like, regardless of you keep your job at, at Brand X, I'm still gonna be plugging brand X because that's my brand. And to mm -hmm. me, influencers take gigs to get paid. Creators are like, no, I'm going to build on Yeah, these. they have like longer term engagements. Like Absolutely. Influent, uh, influential is like an opt-in network. So we like, we go out, we need 20 influencers. We'll go out and we have to have about 50 to get to 20 opt-ins or 25 to choose 20, you know? So there's different ways to engage. Um, and I definitely, I think that's like the, the way that you've honed in on, on it a little bit from a contractual standpoint. Um, is also a way it's like almost like a scatter talent, you it know? Is. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, I mean, even in, even some of the, the, the tools we've used, while we may be hiring an influencer because that's, that's the scope, we are looking for people who have more creator acumen because if a brand says, you know, we like them, we don't have to say, yeah, but they can't go that way. It needs to be a conversation where it's like, yeah, we can take them to the next level because they have that level of ability. Look, beyond engagement rate and reach and all that stuff, it's like, Look, what do they what do they produce? What's the product production quality of what they're putting out there? To what degree is is for their following? Is it you know what's challenging though? Just like to put it up there because it's like a real time thing I'm dealing with after this call too. Is regardless of like pro, um, uh, the production quality and quality of content, the TikTok algorithm is very very challenging. All the other platforms are super tried and true, but the one that's keeping us up every single night because it's very challenging to guarantee like um, view and impression levels. Impression levels are easier. View levels on individual on multi influencer campaigns is keeping everyone at up up at night right now because yeah. that is Ooh. like re regardless of the quality of the content, you just never know if the algo is going to pick it up. Well, the thing what I would say for that is taking the assets as a creator and moving across the ecosystem. That's the difference with- For creator. sure. Most people create for YouTube and then chop it up for other platforms, TikTok, Instagram, et cetera. But people- in this One thing do not do though, if you have an influencer campaign running on TikTok and you have a paid media against it, do not have that influencer post the same piece on TikTok. The algorithm will deprioritize it. Correct, correct. Yeah. But I, when I think about you know brands building community, it's like, how are you gonna use that asset beyond their following? Let's be clear. All influencers, just like anything else, have limitations, meaning limitations relevant for what they're plugging and just limitation in terms of what their engagement rate is going to be. Also, the rented platform, they're they're in it to make money here too. So you got to like, take the asset. They're watching for sure. Put it in your own community and then move it across as many channels as the brand will essentially facilitate. Look, I don't care if you use it as a pop-up event, but it's what you display, display as a reel versus showing your own content. I think what people aren't looking at is, look, if you go hire a, a NBA or NFL football player, you're going to merchandise him like talent with appearances and this, that, and third, and move him across the ecosystem as much as you can afford. What people mm -hmm. need to start doing is looking at creators the same way, because look, it may be an asset that you enlisted for only 10 grand, but to yep. move it across a multi-billion dollar ecosystem now changes the entire value structure as well as the relationship yeah. with that creator. And that to me is more the imaginative thinking of a talent, a, a talent agency who's using A-listers versus people looking at TikTok and like, oh, we're gonna have them do this little widget, little thing, this little stunt and we're done. It's like, no, actually if it's good and we'll move Mindshare and they did it for you, you need to merchandise it across all the touch points possible. Agreed. The community aspect may be where you, you sit it down as the hub. Like our community loves to hear stuff like this more so than they do from us, the brand all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. The economies of scale are interesting with influencers as well, putting creators to the side. 
Um, yeah. You can get them to create more pieces of content for a singular platform, but when you start adding platforms on, it can start to get a, uh, it can start to add costs. So oftentimes, someone will be like, "I'd rather have create more groundswell and have more influencers." I'm like, it's easier to get an influence from the door to have and and with one piece of content to three versus getting more influencers. The cost basis is higher, and so they're always like, there's always this like, like kind of con like, I don't know who put it in people's heads around the more influencers the more impact and reach i'm going to get and performance of my campaign because it's wrong um and paid and earned can be just as important if not equally as important to the campaign because everyone's like organic views organic views you have to remember the platforms algorithms and they're all there to make money so yes. they're not pouring out organic views for free to influencers because they love their content when there's a branded content um, handshake or hashtag ad, which is required legally now. They're not. They're, right. They want you to juice it with paid media, well, which, by the way, benefits you as well, too, because it's a more targeted audience that's more likely to buy your products or services of your clients. Well, let's get into this thing because I love where you're going with this. Let's think about the following. Let's move beyond the creator, the following. Yeah. You know. One of the things, and this is not a shameless plug, it's a real thing. You know, Meltwater has an audience tool that allows you to pull the profile yeah. of an influencer or creator because at the end of the day, the, the creator influence themselves may fit all, check all the boxes for the brand. Look, they may be red carpet worthy with the brand, but their follower may be a totally good consumer profile. What we totally. started is pulling the profile to make sure it matches the brand. And you can do the same thing and make sure it matches the community. But the follower is who you want to pull into the community. You know, the, mm -hmm. the creator influencer is just a figurehead. But to the degree that you can take that, and we started actually retargeting against them. Well, you take the whole audience, right? And you say, what percent of this audience actually is going, is likely to buy my product or owns my product, right? Am I actually marketing? You're actually never going to get to that number, that percent that you want. That's where the paid media comes in. Absolutely. And I think that's yeah. the thing, is that looking at the audience following their profile and trying to match that against the community you're building. And then even to your point about, we'll get into commerce in a section. How many of the what percent of those people can we likely pull into the community and retargeting yep. them back to be part of the broader community that we mine for consumer insights and all the other things? So I, I think what, what, what I see is people are stopping at the fact that we've enlisted an influencer creative and that's it. They did their post and yep. we're done. Like, no, that's the beginning of the catalyst. It's just the beginning. And I think what they're missing is he's an upper, that's an upper funnel activation, influencer creative. What are you doing mid to lower? And obviously yep. when you think about the community aspect, Community lives in kind of the mid funnel because it's not all conversion driven and not everybody in the community buys, but it doesn't want to be upper funnel where it's just awareness and like, look, no one's, everyone's circling the drain and not coming in. So I think the context of that is looking at the community in the middle funnel using upper funnel activations to pull people down. And then that starts to feed the base of who will be your buying audience essentially. Yeah. And from even when you get down, even if it's like 20% of their followers, if you're lucky, right? You can start creating lookalike modeling off of those people too, right? Absolutely. And like, there's like, there's so much you can do with that. It's not a waste. It's a waste if you don't use it and continue it and you just do a post with an influencer or you don't think about what you were mentioning about activating the other communities across their ecosystem, right? Because it, it, they have a lot, their entire community is their universe, right? It's not just a singular, you'll find creators, right? Like will have a, a platform that they somewhat favor right yeah. but they will have a broad reach across other um areas as well so i mean that is entirely something you should be tapped into for sure right right so let's get into commerce because i think part of the discussion is how a community can facilitate that i mean look i think when i when i look at it is you, you start to look at intent you know i focus with a lot of our clients on intent to buy like i'm looking for a buyer i don't want reach i want people who have intent to buy the product or buy the closest competitor that they can dominate do very well again. So search is one of the key signals for intent. So is social in terms of, look, if someone, brands want two things, they want to be bought and spoken about. And there's certain brands right. that are- Yeah, I was just going to say referrals. Right. right. Yeah. There yeah. are certain brands that are talked about highly like Apple and bought at a high level. So social is that signal that if someone's talking about it, there's intent for them to come downstream. What, what I need, you know, I think the, the stick is community needs that signal of who's in who is talking about or shows the intent to buy how do we pull them in for people who don't make won't make the impulsive purchasing bypass community and come through and start making and transacting and how many people need to come into the community to then be sold and then determine okay now i'm going to buy but I, I may be a lifer here like there's I'm, i have long-term customer value traits that i'm going to exhibit over that time period and i think it's you have to use community to discover those commerce signals, as we call them. 
Mm -hmm. I, I think it's like we should like like also maybe caveat that no one's fully solved this yet. No, not at all. <laughs> so, so it's more of a conversation than we have answers for this. There's like some really great products and opportunities out there, but no one's fully solved this yet. No, no. And that's probably the reason you see a lot of uh, the big term is shopper, shopper entertainment, where people yeah. are, or, uh, TikTok is notorious for that. Like it made me buy it because they entertain me and it was highly cool. And I am loving this new trend around, and we played with it for a while and advice, and I just couldn't get it going, but and we knew it was going to happen. But this like, uh, this community around like uh, rebirth of the QVC, yes. um, uh, yes. you know, that you're seeing, and there's a whole bunch of apps that are popping up and Amazon yeah. has like a really good um, uh, leg up on it, but like, there's so much opportunity there um to kind of like elevate but, innovate um in that you know, space the only problem with qbc was it's kind of dry so after a while it, it felt yeah kind of hallmark lifetime network ish but when someone does an entertaining fashion you just got a little bit of break beat it pops then i'm like oh like now i see myself in it less of you just showed me what it cost and you did some 360 views and talked about it like a fireside chat on buying next luggage but when it when it's embedded in lifestyle or in real life so to speak now it has much more of an infectious pull. And I think that's one of the great lessons about community is how to harness a little of that shopper attainment to pull yeah. people into the narrative of talking about it to see themselves in it. And there, there's certain brands- we also do too, to encourage like our communities, whether they're publisher or creator, is like use the Instagram poll, like ask your community questions. That's free. By the way, I did a poll yesterday with Jubilee, our media client. It's an Asian American video community that is uh, created, uh, creates uh, empathetic uh, digital first content uh, on YouTube. I uh, won several YouTube grants and um, we've been with them for 15 years, or it's 15 months, sorry. And they um, literally put up a pet survey for 24 hours and they have about a half a million followers on Instagram. We have 5,000 respondents. Do you know how valuable that information is from, from a commercial standpoint for us to position our temple product, the world's largest vegan dog tree, to all the challenger and brick and mortar stores for dogs, um, tuning our editorial and content towards pet content or, or it, like that, it's just so invaluable on so many levels and it's a free product. Right, right. We actually, if you use a third party, um, uh, survey, you can actually embed it and you can even run it on YouTube as well to get like, if you have multiple different platforms, you could run it on Instagram, you could get a sample from YouTube as well. So we use this all the time across our omni-channel publisher communities to kind of like, hey, what would you like to hear from us about? Hey, we're thinking about doing a series around sustainability. What are the, the important, oh, hey, here are some hosts that we're thinking about using. Or if we do a branded deal with someone, we're like, hey, as part of our partnership, let's talk about what they might want to hear from us together working together. We shouldn't right. be afraid uh, of that. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Let me ask you that on the offshoot of that, because look, we're going to get into, you know, when you think about building online communities in the modern era, first start with understanding the point, points of friction in real life. Like what in real life doesn't work very well, consumers unsatisfied or can't be accomplished. Um, have you ever looked at, uh, are you have any clients on the, on the SMS side? Because obviously that's huge now in terms of notifications. Uh, just for you know, weirdly, laugh, my boyfriend, but he's not needy anymore. He works for a telehealth company. And they manage uh, like, uh, but not directly related to this. The S but I, honestly, the SMS and um, voice and audio stuff is out of control right now. Yeah, yeah. Because I've looked at you know a lot of my more recent purchases. I'm like I'm getting flash sales every single day. Like I get the I flash will, sale I text company. messages. I will click them because I'm a sh always shopping. I'm like, yes. oh, wow, okay. Yes. Let me go check it out. The, the eyewear company I bought my glasses from, literally I get a flash sale like every day for $1, $3 glasses. And I'm like, I will click I have like a if I, if I trust glasses. it, I will click it if it's a sale for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think now we go to stores all the time and people are like, hey, we'll text you when, when, you're, when your reservation's up for a restaurant or we'll text you when you, know, you can come in the store. One, because you have to now keep people out of the perimeter. They can't all be sitting inside. So that's now becoming the norm as an extension of the community. Look, it could be the physical one you're about to walk into and sit where you're enjoying dinner or it's retail or it's the, the virtual one. But we're starting to look at where brands of understanding, okay, there's, there's gray areas we haven't been able to tap into because we operate like this and exist here. But what's the bridge? What brings them in? Or what Going back to brick and mortar? I mean, yeah, like, busy right? Like, yeah. I mean, like, I don't know, like, you see a lot of these digital companies, they're now bridging with physical spaces again, and yeah. they're sort of, their plans are getting sideswiped by the Delta variant right now. 
Um, but, you know, God, the bridge, no one's really found it, but there's been some really great advancements. We talked about some of it earlier with the um, AR filters. Snapchat's been doing it for like six years. Like yeah. they've been wildly ahead of the landscape of bridging that content and commerce specifically within that it's very particular filter product that they have. Um, we are seeing some really interesting areas. I don't, you know, it's like, I'm trying to think of, you know, like, for example, let me use an, an example. I mean, make TikToks not ads in, uh, there was a big thing that went viral a few weeks ago around TikTok maybe buy it, you know, right? And so actually proving the concept around commerce and there's no through lineage, there's no actual product other than TikTok saying by making TikToks, not ads it's working and it's moving your products so um as they're by the way fixing their ad product um offering and suite on the back end right. i'm trying to think of some other interesting intersections that i'm seeing these about, days uh, virtual fundraising was one of the other topics because yeah that you know the, that was one of the things I mean, that's a big, big um, center, central focus over at, at uh, Facebook with their creator studio as well. Um, you know, Facebook um, fundraising tool is phenomenal. It's all in a desktop in the same uh, web page and app. It doesn't jump off anywhere. Um, it's a really great way to like, if you're looking to bridge purpose and more calm objectives, drive engagement, um, fundraisers have a really, really great turnout. And it's very, very easy for a nonprofit to register within the Facebook fundraising tool. They've been advancing it off the back end of it as well with Instagram. Instagram is not as far as advanced, but the, uh, the power of the tool is still very, very strong. And as we mentioned earlier, some um, influencers or creators will favor one platform or another. For example, we work with Shirley Rains from Beauty to the Streets. Um, she's here in, uh, in Long Beach and then works in Skid Row, um, um, boosting confidence through her esthetician degree. Um, she's a really amazing human being and her nonprofit's called Beauty to the Streets. But, you know, we were trying to work with our client who is like, tapping into her community, right? She's got 300,000 followers that champion her, that donate to her, right? And we were doing a campaign and Shirley Rains is a local hero, but also like somewhat of a national hero. So she has local and national exposure right now. And then right. a wildly engaged community on Instagram. And they were like pushing for Facebook. And I'm like, she's on Instagram. And even though the Instagram fundraising tool jumps you to a web page, you know, sign up and donate the money and they're fixing that should be yep. done by the end of the quarter. It was like really imperative that we didn't try and push or allow our client to say, do this on Facebook and back us into a corner when it made sense to do it on Instagram. Right. Yep. And so, and, and I, you know, that like community, that, that, that particular, and I would put, you know, Shirley Rains is, is really like an activist. You know, we talk about influencers and creators. She's an activist. So I almost would almost create another subset there. She has a whole le other level of respect that I have for her. Um, and so it's really interesting the way, the ways that you can like leverage that and the engagement on these things um, are just phenomenal. Not to mention the money that you raise for a nonprofit and hopefully the good that that does for the communities that that nonprofit is involved in. And so that's a waterfall effect there, right? So if you do a fundraise with a with a, an organization and a nonprofit that's associated with Facebook and Instagram, the engagement, the people that donate, the people that like, those are all people that are like now part of your community and that you can you use all these tactics that we're talking about right now as well as by the way, doing something really amazing, what we call an impact campaign. But um that is pretty amazing as well. Um, so I, I, we're huge fans. We're doing a lot of that work right now. Nuances around fundraising can vary by client. And there's a lot of red tape there, but aspirationally from a macro standpoint, we're leaning heavily into it. Um, and the engagement is out of control. Our client Upworthy ran um, uh, a fundraiser for It Gets Better, which is an LGBT um, nonprofit here in LA. We had no paid media behind it. We raised $177,000 on a $10,000 um, goal. It was pretty cool. amazing. Well, look, man, we can keep going. I know we got about 10 minutes left, at least in the scheduled time. So I wanted to throw back Christine and help us punch through some QA. One thing not to forget about is all the virtual currency things going on in these platforms. Oh, yeah. yeah, too. yeah. That, yeah. That's it for another day, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So, Christine, I'll hand yeah. you back to the floor. I don't know if there were some things you fielded from, you know, the group of attendees and, or some things you just want to address, but. Yeah, I mean, honestly, thank you guys so much. I know you guys could both talk about this for days on end. 
Um, but yeah, happy to open it up to the group. Um, I also have a few questions here to kind of kick things off. Um, and then, yeah, anyone can just like chime in or, or raise their hand. But um, what is the relationship between community management and brand reputation? Super important, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, man, I mean, we're, I, I don't know, Albert, if you want to kind of riff yeah, on this I, one. I don't have a solid answer on this one other than they're blending more than ever these days. Yeah, I mean, I think the brand has a perception of who it is and the consumer has it relatively inked who they are. So I think you have to be very honest about how, how you're seen to who is keeping you in business. So when I think about community management, one is to safeguard the brand reputation, here are the guidelines, here are the expectations, here's how we'll show up and present. But I think you have to be very reflective of how the community sees you and what is believable. I think sometimes there's a disconnect. Look, if you're in a relatively simple, more simplistic business, great. But if you're in a business where prestige or a certain moniker, let's say it's luxury is being upheld, that's, that's got to be believable. I think there are certain brands that think they are higher than they really are when the consumer says, no, you're actually here. You're not here. So when, the, yeah. when you run the community, you can maintain a standard of here, but the language has to be here. And what you often find is that uh, communities alienate because the consumer is like, yeah, but that's not how we identify. That's how, that's, think about two identities, visual and spoken. Community management is really about understanding the spoken identity. What do people say about you when you're not around? Because you have to be very honest about it with this. It's part of the reason you got to do social listening because you got to understand the foundation where you sent. You got to understand where sentiment is coming from, why it exists, why it was formed, where it can go. And if you're trying to clean that up, and hopefully a lot of community aspects do that because there is a customer service aspect, you need to understand the plateau you're trying to aim for and how you're trying to move customer mind share to that. Because I think one of the things we find is that the community will defend you on your worst day. And that's whether you end up in the news, you end up in the middle of a scandal, you end up in the middle of a you know, uh, you know, what kind of storm, but they, that has everything to do to what degree they will come to your defense is very much how they see you based on the reputation you've been selling. And look, there, there are a lot of, and it's part of the reason that I'll tell a client, look, you want to know how people think of the worst, like go and yell and, and understand it. Glass door. Absolutely. Because that you can center yourself on what you need to fix. And I think brands are so enamored more or less with themselves and the moniker in the corporate offices they don't touch the consumer enough. They don't really understand. Look, community is con touching the consumer. That's like walking into retail. Also their culture, which Absolutely. is their brand. And so like these things internally, these large fortune 10 companies that we work with all the way down to our, our small little uh, emerging media businesses, the community and brand thing is not no longer just like a, uh, like a CMO or if they even have a real Marcom organization, but like the CEO should have their eyes on this too, right? Because it is that the health and the, the the DNA of the overall business, and should be make there should be informed decisions made across all that together. Yeah, and the community represented the customer may far outlive any employee at the company. I mean, look, there are always people who've been there for sure, but at the senior level leadership, there's so much churn. A customer can say, "Yeah, when you're long gone, I'll I'll still be here cracking away at this product." So you'd be better off paying attention to things that I'm, I'm saying because you may be on to the next competitive brand in 18 months and that's what happens. And that's the power of community recognizing that they understand that at the top in leadership and strategic decisions, there's, those, there's no real time in for amongst those people. They're not lifers. They're, there's too much, as you said, in the massive shuffle taking place that the consumer's like, we're, we're here to stay regardless. You know, it was really, I'll use a really quick example. Uh, I'm a gamer, like a few months ago, PlayStation announced that they were going to discontinue the PlayStation Vista support with the uh, huge, huge challenge of microchips and no one, I can't even get a PlayStation 5 and I know the PlayStation people. And so you've got a whole bunch of gamers that can't even get the latest technology. You've got challenges with developers who only made games for that. Then you've got PlayStation, someone over brand saying, hey, discontinue Vista, it just doesn't make financial sense. And you've got shortages all over the place. And then they go and do this in the entire Vista community just to revolt it. There's hundreds and wow. hundreds of thousands of people that are part of that community. And the Vista community is part of a larger PlayStation community. So before they even understood the ripple effect happened, they had to retract that they were certainly supporting Vista and their entire brand messaging campaign that's going on is about the entire PlayStation community, not by, you know, and like, so, and the subsets of it, five, four, Vista, you know, right. And so 
there are there's just so much complexity and understanding that you have to have and why it's important for brand and community to be tied together. It is absolutely. And what they have to understand is there's almost no degrees of separation in this world. So when you're sitting there saying that, like, those people are like, look, broader PlayStation community, we help build your entire console business from the ground up, zero. So at the end of the day, we are, we are very much- Also, by the way, I don't know if they didn't listen to us, but like last week they posted on Twitter, what are you playing? What are you on their Twitter handle? And that created a whole nother wake of problems. Like, hello, do we not just go through this with you? Yes. Like literally go to it. It's all over the internet right now. I just happened a few days ago. PlayStation core Twitter handle goes, what are you playing? Yeah. Well, let's and think they're about all like nothing yeah. on PlayStation 5 over here. <laughs> right. Like think so, about how many lost leaders the average company manages between shut down corporate offices, old rotten plants, stuff that makes no money but is on the books. Think about the notion of turning off a community, but still carrying assets Ooh, there. I don't, I don't at, know whose LA. idea it was to shut that down. Right. Bad right. idea. And yeah. that's, that's the thing that's very interesting is community is much more plugged to the business vitality. There are, there are, you know, so let's, let's look at the defunct Sears and JCP uh, buildings and, and malls that are just rotting. That are, that are still basically debt assets being carried uh, by companies because they, they, nobody wants it. So they're, they're just sitting on the books. Where they ruin the community. I mean, right. there's so many examples out there. I mean, right. like Tumblr, right? Like, right. Um, right. I mean, we could, we could talk about everything. I mean, I worked at AOL for three years. You know, my companies and communities we bought and ruined. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the notion probably less in the community is that you have to understand it's like water in the flood. It, it, it seeps and extends into everything. You'd have to do a lot of discovery work to look at what you can actually extract. And there goes your reputation. And these publishing companies are communities now, too. You're, yes. You know, the moment you, in, you turn on comments and comments are enabled. Absolutely. You're a community. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing is people need to understand the, rule, the rules of engagement for what now constitutes community. It's not a about, single article can create a community. Right. It's not necessarily just a proprietary platform that you're spending a lot of money against. I think there it it sits on the fringes. They're like outliers, but they are they are threads into the broader compound that you manage and maintain. And I think what a lot of people look at is that we have a Facebook community, we have an Instagram community, and we have this proprietary community. Like, no, it actually extends much further into the ether every time you put out a press release. And you need mm -hmm. to start looking at where your namesake extends to because where it extends, there's a reputation of someone talking about it, hence the community. And that's really the framework. It would look like a spider web. You know, there might be a whole thing that's trapped in the middle, but look at how far that last uh, thread of extension yeah. extends out and what it's holding on to. What are they saying when you're not in the room? Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Jason and Albert, thank you so much. That was incredible and i'm sure we all gained so much knowledge i saw a ton of head nodding and laughing and that's really what we want so thank you so much and now we went over so i want to be respectful of everyone's times um but yeah if anyone else has has anything to say i will just leave it at that all right it was fun thank you everyone